Hello everybody! Today I have a fun little uh, painting process for you featuring Link Legend of Zelda. So let's get started. Um, usual sort of apologies I guess first and foremost. A sorry I sound so sniffly. Springtime allergies kick my ass every year. This is no different. Um, I'm not sick. I just have things in my nose. <laughs> Smiles. And also, sorry if you can hear footsteps or car traffic or seagulls or whatever. I live in an apartment building in a city. Ish, a small city. Anyway, so there's just going to be noise. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, buy me a new microphone if you <laughs> want uh, better audio quality. Anyway, uh, back to the art. So this video is a first because well actually i don't know the order i'm posting videos i'm like editing two videos at the same time right now um and this one basically the spread you're seeing to the left of link right now um that one did have real-time footage but this one is the first like full beginning to end process with voiceover video that has not been sped up at all. The real time was about, I think it was an hour or like an hour 20 minutes. And as you can see, I've kind of chopped it down to about 30, 31 minutes. Um, that's mainly just cause I cut out, I tried to, you know, there's an art to making like aesthetic process videos, you know? And I was kind of trying to figure that out as I was going, cause it's not really something I've done before. And I generally just have trouble making anything look aesthetic. Um, anyway, the bulk of it was like parts where I pause, which I think are valuable if you're like looking at somebody's process, but it's just not very interesting to watch. <laughs> so in a note, like if y'all really want me to keep in every time I pause and don't move my pencil at all and I'm just like looking or like I kind of, I do a lot of like practicing my strokes before I put them down. If that's something you want to see in a process video like this, I'll leave it in next time. But since this is new to me, I was trying to like streamline it as much as possible while also leaving in as much as possible. So it's mainly just like dead air time, aka when I'm not moving my pencil or brush later. And then there are some parts where um, I'm using like a new setup. I got one of those canvas lamps. I might do a review on it if that's something people would be interested in. I got like the mini one. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's basically just like a, um, it's like an architecture lamp, I guess. I think that's like what they're called, but it has like a ring light attached to it and a little phone clamp. So like, it's really great for recording videos. I actually really am enjoying it, but why was I talking about that? <laughs> Oh no. Oh no, the voiceover itis is hitting. Um I remember. I remember why I was talking about that. Um there are some parts because I didn't like fix the autofocus, like I didn't actually like make it focused on the paper that like I wanted to include a lot more of my color mixing process cuz I think that'd be interesting for people to see and I've been asked to like show that more. Which, you know, I'm not trying to gatekeep or anything, but the the footage is just, like, unwatchable because <laughs> it keeps focusing on my hand and not the mixing. And so there's a lot of parts where, like, depending on how I'm holding the thing I'm using, it'll, like, kind of bounce back and forth on the focus and it's just, like, not very good. I'll I'll do better next time. All right, we'll get them next time. Um, So, yeah, I cut that, a lot of that footage out just because it's not nice to watch. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but we're drawing Link, so let's talk about what we're drawing, maybe. Uh, you know, I- it's interesting because I've always really liked Legend of Zelda on, like, the conceptual level in my brain. I haven't actually played a lot of Zelda. I think the gateway to Zelda for me was actually Creepypasta. Uh, the Ben Drowned story was awesome to me when I was, like, 11 years old. <laughs> it was very fun. It was, it was a great time. And so I've just really, I like, I like the world, but I, a lot of the Zelda games, the actual gameplay, like, is just not the types of games I like to play. Um, however, 
Breath of the Wild is amazing, as uh, I'm sure you've heard of this little indie game by uh, this indie development company called Nintendo, but yeah, Breath of the Wild is amazing, and I still, like, haven't beaten it. <laughs> I just started a new playthrough, actually, because I... Listen, I, I think upon watching people play Tears of the Kingdom now, I do think it's worth $70. There's a lot of stuff in that game. However, I just don't want to spend $70 right now on a video game. Like, spending $25 on a video game right now hurts a little bit. So, that's just going to have to wait. Again, my birthday's next month, so if you want to get me something, you can get me that. <laughs> but, 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 I, uh... I've been playing Breath of the Wild again, and I've been watching people play Tears of the Kingdom, so I wanted to draw Link. I like his weird new arm. It's a very horror. There's a lot of horror aspects in Tears of the Kingdom, which I wasn't anticipating, but I'm very much down for. Um, so yeah, that was kind of it. There wasn't really like a deep meaning behind this piece. I was just like, I want to draw Link. I want to draw his new arm. Uh, yeah, so in terms of the painting process, let's let's actually talk about the art. Um, so the sketching process you just saw, um, this is in a royal, no, it's in a Talons Art Creations sketchbook, which I don't think is actually marketed for like acrylic or wet media. I use my acrylics in a very dry way, so I haven't noticed any particular problems with like, I think it actually handles acrylic paint really well. It doesn't handle, it doesn't handle wet media well at all. So, like, watercolor stuff, just can't do it. But I like using acrylics in here. So I started out with a pencil sketch. Um, the pencil exactly doesn't matter. Um, just, you know, just did a pencil sketch. And then I went in on top with... Uh, underpainting of burnt sienna plus a little bit of like cad orange and I say that in quotes it's not actually cad orange that's like it's just like a bright orange uh, I wanted it to be a little bit lighter than just the burnt sienna out of the tube um, and I like doing that just because it gives um, it really unifies the whole piece a lot more so than if there was just paper underneath and you accidentally left paper showing um it doesn't have to be burnt sienna it can be any color you want really i like to choose colors that oppose the sort of main color palette of the piece and so since there's a lot of blue and green i decided to do a reddish orange for the underpainting and it really makes it glow in a way that the light paper does not and also i just think like trying to cover all of the page with paint is like the least exciting process of painting to me i'm just like i don't care let me let me actually get into the fun part of painting so by doing an underpainting it helps speed that process along because you don't really like have to as much per se i mean you don't have to do anything art <laughs> you know art is subjective i don't need to tell you that and so now I'm just going to be, I'm, I'm doing the blocking in part of the painting. Um, there are some, there are, I would say probably half and half times where I will actually go about, like, actually putting down a base on everything and then adding details. And then there are other times where I'm just like, I, I, I need to, you know, I'm very much at the beck and call of my brain and what my brain thinks is interesting and exciting and so if I find myself starting to slip I'm like okay I need to I need to do like fun stuff good stuff like I can't be doing the boring stuff anymore um which is probably not good <laughs> um but you know you know it's, it's whatever it's that's just that's just how I roll baby um so yeah started with the arm and now I'm using kind of the excess of the arm paint on the background. I find I do that a lot with paint. Um, I, I, my process is not very methodical. <laughs> like, I'm obviously thinking about each step while I'm doing it, but I, I do tend to use paint in an intuitive way where I'm like, okay, I have this excess on my brush. Where can I use the excess on my brush that isn't in the spot I was just using it? Mainly because, like, I don't know why, but in my brain, I'm like, if I waste any paint at all, I'm gonna be like, 
stoned to death like Shirley Jackson, the lottery style. Um, that's over dramatic, but I just, I don't, I don't mix large quantities of paint and I don't like mixing large quantities of paint. And so you'll see there are definitely parts in this process where I'm basically just like dry brushing the page with my brush just because there's just like no paint on it. I think my current job, which is teaching paintings at like a bar basically, I think that is helping with that, um, I don't know if it's a problem per se, but with that self-ascribed problem, um, I just don't mix large quantities of paint and I don't know why I don't like to. I think it's just because like I'm very particular about what colors I'm using where. I I'm not really like the type of person who likes large swaths of flat color. I like I like color variation and I like seeing where those color variations kind of happen naturally. And so the idea of mixing up like a gallon of paint for like one area, like ugh, like ugh, I just don't like I don't like mixing large quantities of paint. I don't know why. So yeah, you can see like even on my palette where I have included little mixing parts, um, I, I just, I don't mix a lot of paint at a time. And I also think that's because I paint pretty small. I do tend to paint like in my sketchbook and like not on like very large surfaces. So I just don't need a lot of paint. And I also tend to just kind of cannibalize sections where I've already mixed colors, um, mainly because... I I, th I would say, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I think I have a pretty good aptitude of remembering what I mixed colors with. Like, even if I don't actually, like, consciously remember, I can, like, intuit how I mixed a color and get back there really easily. So I'm not worried about, like, preserving the sanctity of any color mix I do, because, like, I can probably just get back there again or get something similar enough to where it's not a problem. So yeah, you'll see um, as we go on, like the little patches of color outside of the main uh, circles where the base colors are, uh, they, they change over time. <laughs> and I, the actual paint I'm using is just like student quality paint. Uh, it's a Liquitex Basics, and then there's also a little bit of, I think it's Blick acrylic paint. Um, the yellow that you can see on the palette there is actually like craft paint. It's like the plaid apple, <laughs> apple barrel paint. Um, I really like that stuff. I'm trying to like get myself to not use it as much so that I like start using good quality paint so I can like sell paintings if I ever wanted to just because um, yeah, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the best paint in the world, but I do like it, and I like it for sketchbook stuff, specifically. But yeah, I just wanted to say that, in case you were curious about the materials I'm using, really not fancy stuff. I guess the, the Seafoam Green is Artist Loft, which is, like, Michael's brand, um, but again, that's still, like, student quality paint, um, I wouldn't use like artist quality stuff necessarily in my sketchbook for something like this just because like I don't know the the painting process like the feel of the paint is good enough to where I don't find myself like wanting to use artist quality. I will say like for stuff like gouache I feel like every video I go on a rant about gouache and my problems with it but with student quality gouache I just don't like it. I feel like I can feel the uh binders and the lack of pigment on my brush and it's just very chalky and like I don't know like I like generally I paint pretty dry like with my even with like my oil paintings and my watercolor paintings I'm, I'm not doing a lot of wet techniques um and so with gouache when you're using it really thick like that it just feels very dry versus acrylic it doesn't feel that dry even when you're dry brushing it fucking boat horn out there anyway yeah i i i like acrylic paint because it glides better to me in my opinion than gouache ever does particularly student grade quality gouache 
and I don't, I have like, somewhere, I have two tubes of artist quality gouache. I got black and white, and I remember liking those. Like, we got somewhere with those, but I think generally I don't like paint that reactivates. I don't find it necessary for me. I would rather paint over something versus try to lift it and like rework it. Um, I guess that's just kind of like how I feel about my art process generally. Like I would rather just do it again versus try to like uh, raise it from the grave and like reactivate it. And so the, the positive qualities of gouache, aka like it lays down colors really flat and smooth and you can reactivate it don't care like it just doesn't do anything for me so then the negative qualities of it like how much the color shifts from wet to dry and the feeling of it on the brush um it's just not worth it to me versus something like acrylic paint which um you know it doesn't reactivate but i don't need it to like i'm just i just be painting i also think maybe that's because i do digital art a lot and digital painting and in that you're not um you're not reactivating it you're i mean there are, there are, there are some like quote unquote wet on wet techniques you can do as much as pixels on a screen can be wet or dry um but i tend to just layer on top of itself without like trying to blend or smudge or anything anyway as you can see i am uh, still, still blocking in those colors. I just keep talking, and me in the past keeps painting. We are in a forever cycle. I don't know. Anyway, back to back to talking about Legend of Zelda. Let's talk about let's talk about Link in Zelda. Um, yeah, there's I don't know why I never really played any of the Zelda games. I guess I was just always a Mario boy. Like, I remember. Like, there are core memories I have of playing, like, New Super Mario Bros. for the DS with my brother. And we'd take turns. And he got farther than I did. And I was so pissed. But I just played the uh, mini games, and it was fine. Um, <laughs> that, that that was enough for me. But, um, yeah, Zelda... I, I guess my, my household just wasn't a Zelda household. Like, um, we had Mario... And we had, like, Crash Bandicoot, and, like, that was enough boys for us. Like, we just didn't have a place for Link in our household. Maybe it was toxic masculinity? I don't know. <laughs> Kidding about that. But, um, yeah. The the Sims was my main game for a long time. Um, I, when, my, my brother actually got The Sims 3 in, like, 2009. And he played it for, like, a week and then stopped and then I was like, hold on, what is this? And it did something to my brain chemistry. And I, I've spent thousands of hours playing The Sims. I wish I was kidding. But yeah, you know, it's how I learned how to pirate, because you can very easily pirate The Sims 2. Not that I'm encouraging anything, nor am I saying I actually did that. That was all a lie, and it was alleged uh, to any FBI people listening. But yeah, um... So, like, The Sims, and, like, obviously I love the Stardew Valley and, like, Animal Crossing. I, I don't know, I don't tend to seek out cozy games, per se, but I do like, you know, quote-unquote cozy games. Um, I like rhythm games, but only the ones where it's really about rhythm and not about the game part. Like, I'm good at rhythm heaven, basically, and that's it. Like, stuff, like, as soon as we get past, like, four or five buttons, you lose me. Like, I can't. Like, even, even, like, directional arrow stuff freaks me out. Like, low-level Guitar Hero is about as much as my brain can handle. And, actually, okay, I think I know why I didn't play Legend of Zelda. It's because my intro to it was through Majora's Mask, and the concept of the time running out and you needing to do everything quote unquote in the three days before the moon killed everything was so scary to me like so stressful i was like no i can't do that um i'm gonna play the sims 3 again bye and so 
Yeah, obviously that's like the only Zelda game that has that sort of mechanic. And I think it's a cool mechanic, especially because like, you know, you don't actually have to do it in those three days, but it didn't matter to me when I was younger. Like, it was just too much. And yeah, so Breath of the Wild, I think I played, I tried playing like Minish Cap or something on the Game Boy. I think I like emulated it once, but I just like didn't get anywhere. So I've like watched people play Zelda games and it's very fun, but I, Breath of the Wild is the first one I've really like sinking my teeth into and really enjoyed. Um, and yeah, I just think it's, it's a beautiful game. I think the sound design is really something like the use of music. I keep finding myself thinking about and being like, wow, like it's just so particular and smart and the world obviously is like massive and beautiful i mean i don't think y'all need me to like hype up <laughs> you don't need me to hype up breath of the wild i think it's like a pretty universal opinion that it's a good game i don't think i'm like saying anything revolutionary um back to the process right now i'm adding in the lines i think when i started i wasn't sure if i was gonna um I wasn't sure how I was going to approach the lines. I think maybe I was thinking like, oh, I could do like color pencil or I just got these new Neo Color Caran d'Ache like crayons. And I was like, oh, I could do something with that. But I I liked the way the burnt sienna looked coming through uh, between like the base colors of everything. So I decided to go back in with that and sort of just reestablish the lines that were already there. And yeah, I think I think that was a good choice. You know, nice job past me. Made a good art choice. <laughs> First one in your life. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um oh, I was also gonna talk about the Hunger Games. <laughs> Speaking of girls who use bows and arrows, um, that's been my life recently. I've been um playing Breath of the Wild, reading the rereading the Hunger Games. Yeah, it's it's crazy how good the Hunger Games is. Like, again, I'm not not being like a, this is not a controversial take, hopefully, but like, it's just written well. It's a good story that's written well in a compelling way. And I think so many of like, the other books that were big at the time that were trying to like, capitalize on the oh girl overthrows dystopian government like they don't understand what made the hunger games good like it's just like the it's just so smart okay like it's a very smartly written book and katniss has a personality and you can feel it when you're reading it you really feel like you're in her head you're there at the games and the movie fuck the movie the movie sucks i think that might be a controversial opinion but the the shaky cam like oh my god if you watch it again like now it's so bad the shaky cam every like okay every half second there's a cut so you can't see anything and then when you can see things the camera's shaking so bad that it's like uh, I might as well be closing my eyes and listening to an audiobook. Like, the the idea of adapting a book into a movie is that you can see what's happening in the book on a screen. And so when you choose to film it in such a way that you can't see what was happening in the book, and also you make choices that don't make it any stronger, um, it's... It, why? Just why? Why? Why did we do that? Um... I don't know if I'll watch Catching Fire and the Mockingjay movies because, okay, I've only read the first Hunger Games book. I started Catching Fire when I was in sixth grade because I, I read the first one in sixth grade. Started Catching Fire, but I didn't finish it. And so now I'm reading Catching Fire and I'll be getting to a point where uh, we're in new territory and I don't know what's happening. But yeah, like, oh, the and also... I don't know anything about Jennifer Lawrence. I'm going to say I hope she's a good person. I don't know anything about her, like, on a personal level. She's not Katniss. <laughs> like, I I feel conflicted about Josh Hutchinson as PETA. I think I think he's all right. I, I understand the casting choice. Um, but, like, oh, she just sucks as Katniss. Like, 
she knows what an iPhone is, right? Like, she has the face of someone who knows what an iPhone is. She cannot play a 16-year-old girl in a dystopian district. Like, even when she's supposed to be, a, like, the filthiest, like, muckiest point in the games, like, she looks like, um, maybe it's been three days since she showered. Like, that's the extent of the muck. And it's so like uh, like hashtag not my Katniss <laughs> anyway yeah that's why that's my Hunger Games rant <laughs> I'm, I'm really enjoying the books but like I remember liking the movie when I watched it originally but man man it's bad and also I don't um cover your ears I guess if you don't want a Hunger Games spoiler for the first book the end of the first book but I forgot that the mutations, like the dogs that they sent after the final three were like, I guess I don't know. Okay, so the way that I interpreted it is that they actually like mutilated the corpses of the children who died and turned them into these mutated werewolf things, which is horrifying. Like, that is so scary. They could have maybe just made them to have reminiscent features of the tributes who died already, but I interpreted it like they're literally playing God and like sending the ghosts of the people that they have had to kill to get to this point to come after them, which is like awesome, but so scary. And then in the movie, they're just like normal, like weird wolves. Like, I guess the movie kind of changed the uh, memory that I had of it because I thought they were like, <laughs> you know, they're weird wolves. I guess it's like Maximum Ride, like the erasers. I guess that's kind of like what I was thinking of where they're just like, yeah, you know, they're big and like fucked up and they'll kill you. But like, they're just like weird wolves. But it's like, no, in the book, it's like way worse. And so that choice, I, I guess maybe, you know, with the shaky cam, it might be hard to get the nuance of Katniss recognizing the wolf that's trying to kill her as Rue, like I, I guess maybe they wouldn't have been able to accomplish that on film so maybe that's why but yeah just like not a good not a good movie but a really good book <laughs> back to the painting <laughs> um I think one of my favorite parts that happened like 40 million years ago now uh is the highlights and the hair I've been really enjoying those kind of uh highlight shapes I don't really know what to call them per se um i kind of echoed the shape language in his top surgery scars um which by the way if that makes you mad just like leave and like leave me alone i don't care um but yeah i've been really enjoying that sort of shape recently i think it's very fun to do especially in hair i think it's really fun and then i also did add a bit more of a glow to the arm um, I thought I was going to do more of like a cast shadow against his body, but I, I I then remembered like, oh yeah, that stuff's like glowing. I should probably make it glow. And so I added, I added a glow to it. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to like rack my brain on what else to talk about. Oh, I, I, yeah, I do. I just want to talk about the arm a little bit, I guess. I, I think it's such a interesting, like, like, it really does feel Majora's Mask-y in the tone. Like, I saw some people on Tumblr talking about, and, like, rightfully so, that um, if you have any experience with, like, procedures being done against your will in a medical setting, that the arm will be upsetting to you because it's in the text is, like, textually treating as a foreign thing that's been put on you without your consent and you talk to the guy that the arm came from i mean also i haven't finished the game so i don't really know beyond like the intro sort of like cutscene and like the first um the first dragon or whatever you kill i don't know i don't know the names of the guys the big guys um but 
yeah i i understand how it can be triggering for some people and so that viewpoint totally fair but also i think it's like it's so interesting and like dark and also i guess there's more dark stuff in the game as well because like there's the like underground part oh i i love i love the like corruption that they've shown through the landscape i think it's such an interesting way to make the game feel different from the first one even though it's technically on the same map it's just like very smart game i think it shows that you know these people have been making zelda games for a long time and they uh, know what they're doing and wow we're done thank you for watching and listening and enjoying and hope to see you next time Bye bye